if you are not mature mentally and are not well fundamentally grounded in the art of magic, do not try this at home. I repeat, do not try this anywhere. Y'all, today we're going to be going into some hidden secrets of how to make a contract with a low dimensional demon. So when someone says that they have signed a contract, or better yet, when someone says they have sold their soul, this is the proper way that it is done. If they can't explain it this way, they tell them a goddamn lie. Let's go into the book by the Ascended Master, Franz Bardun, a magician, a brother of the light. We shall go into his book, The Practice of Magical Evocation. Let's go. In this connection, I must point out that the magician must have a clear idea of what a contract is, how such a contract is made, what are its disadvantages, etc. I shall now give further details on this point. Should the sorcerer or necromancer succeed in actually calling the head of a certain sphere into the physical world by the ecstatic elevation of his spirit, such a head, if it is a negative one, will always try to get under his influence, not only the soul, but also the spirit of the sorcerer, in order to make him fully dependent. The sorcerer usually realizes during his second or third operation that he is no longer able to get himself into the same state of ecstasy which previously helped him to have a certain influence on the concerned sphere. This is reason enough for a feeling of uneasiness within him, which usually causes him literally to seize hold of the being appearing to him in order to have his desires realized. The head now appearing to the sorcerer would not at all react to him if he were not sure that the sorcerer's soul and spirit were mature enough for him, and that, therefore, it pays to try to get both. The head sees the many karmic developments which the sorcerer may have undergone already, and during which he has reached a certain degree of intelligence and maturity, and he is therefore certain that the sorcerer will render him good service after his death. The being knows about all this already in its own sphere while watching the sorcerer carrying out his operations. If it seems advantageous enough, a head, usually a negative one, will appear to the sorcerer and will try to get the sorcerer for itself at any cost, depending on the character of the sorcerer. The being will apply the most valuable methods, knowing well the most vulnerable points where it can hit the sorcerer. If, for instance, the sorcerer is anyhow fearful, the being will try to frighten him in order to make him obey. If, however, the sorcerer is somehow aware of his spiritual and psychic faculties, the being will try to win him with all kinds of promises. For instance, with the promise that it will do anything, etc. But at the same time, it will point out that such a thing is not possible without a mutual agreement and will point out the advantages of such a contract. Now, as y'all can see, 
we getting close to how this contract is about to be written up. What takes place? It is then up to the sorcerer to resist the temptations of the being and to oppose it. A fight within the sorcerer's own conscience will start and will develop into a terrible one. For the conscience of a man is the most subtle form of the divine prominence. If, however, the sorcerer is not willing to listen to the divine warnings, again, if, however, the sorcerer is not willing to listen to the divine warnings, that is to follow his conscience, but suppresses it in spite of its repeated appearance. In spite of its repeated appearance, then he becomes a victim of the being by making an agreement or a contract with it. This thing will certainly interest everybody. Therefore, I will examine it more closely from the hermetic angle. Why does a spirit being want to get possession of the soul and spirit of a sorcerer? Hmm. There are several reasons for this. Firstly, no being, least of all a negative one, will ever do anything for the sorcerer without the hope of getting a relevant, relevant reward. The sorcerer is forced by contract to leave the earth zone after he has cast away his physical body. He is indeed taken away by the devil as legend state and must travel to the sphere of of that being with which he has made a contract in order to serve. There as its servant. The head with whom the contract has been made usually employs a deceased sorcerer as a messenger to the astral, mental or physical sphere of the earth zone where he has to carry out commissions for his master corresponding to the negative sphere of that being. Such a head likes to get into connection with a sorcerer because the latter has been created as the image of God and therefore has four poles and consequently many more possibilities than the being itself. Now in most cases, the head servant in this case, a human being is made into a spiritus familiaris or factotum and put at the disposal of other similar sorcerers. And the function of a spiritus familiaris, the sorcerer, then is given all the power the head itself possesses. Since from that moment he is deputizing for the being, the transfer of power upon the sorcerer is effected either by an anchor from the head or the principle of demons or by influencing him with zone power so that he can either bring about the ordered effect by himself and secure the results wanted, or he is supplied with other servants to help him carry out his commissions. But whether such servants are true inhabitants of the zone and as such mere subordinates of their masters or whether they really are victims as described above is difficult to determine, for such beings are not allowed to tell anybody anything about themselves and this is the real reason why shriners have the sword on their face their face cap 
is to represent if you tell a secret about the demon that you have a contract with, you will be killed. That demon will slay you. Not just slay you. He will torture you in a ways that a man can't torture you. It's going to be like your ass going to be slayed. In other words. So the torture that these demons will bring to a mortal that breaks a contract is so terrible that they wish that they was dead. See, these Freemasons are studying the Egyptian knowledge. But they are brothers of dark magic once they sign these contracts with these low dimensional beings. Let us continue. It is also possible that the unwanted phases in the memory or consciousness of such spirits have been deleted either by a magic spell or other practices. And so, the sorcerer, in spite of the qualities he has on account of his four-pole nature, becomes dependent on the head sphere that is on his master's sphere, and that prevents him from freeing himself of the ties with his head and from living his own life. He becomes a willless instrument of the head and must do everything the latter the later wants or the latter wants damn y'all see this the same way that throw the Atlantean um uh, really then he didn't give this type of full detail on how Earthman summoned these reptilian motherfuckers from the abyss but right here we are witnessing how it is orchestrated, these blood signed contracts. But let us continue. After having sealed the contract or pact, the sorcerer cannot do any work for weeks or months. During this time, he is taught by his head various practices and is initiated into the use of his powers. The sealing of such a pact is actually not much different from what is stated in the grimoires or magic books. There is, however, a little difference hardly known to anybody. The pact itself is not compiled by the spirit being, but is in fact drawn up and written by the sorcerer himself, like the Book of Charms. The text of the pact is written down in ordinary ink, special ink. So you could do it different ways. Special ink. Hmm. However, it may be used for this purpose depending on the rituals applied. But this is not so important. The contract clearly states what services have to be rendered by the being which wishes it fulfilled. Which possibilities are giving the sorcerer with this pact including other conditions which must be fulfilled by the being on behalf of the sorcerer. On another page of the contract, the duties are laid down which, on the other hand, the sorcerer must carry out for the being and which, on the other hand, the being orders itself to carry out. It further states in which manner the head can be called and whether it has to appear visibly or invisibly. How servants put at the sorcerer's dis disposal have to be treated, etc. The most important point is the period for which the contract is valid and that after the expiration date of the contract, the sorcerer is obligated to travel to the sphere of the demon. Hmm... Also, the way in which the sorcerer will die in the physical world and how he will move over into the sphere of the head is fixed by contract. All points and conditions are agreed by both parties and the being usually signs the contract by its own seal, using the sorcerer's hand as a medium and the mutual agreement 
is countersigned. It is also quite possible that the being asked for or insist on the sorcerer signing the contract with his own blood. Bam! This the same shit that thought the Atlantean talked about in his Emrim tablets. Okay? He talked about this shit during the time of Atlantis. Motherfuckers been signing blood contracts with blood. Putting blood on altars. Making blood sacrifices. To conjure up low dimensional Damians. Or demons. So let's just say if you really wanted to get in contact with the jealous God in the Bible. The bloodthirsty God in the Bible. You have to do some shit similar to these contracts. But you have to make a a actual blood sacrifice. You had to kill somebody or kill something that you really love. You see these low dimensional beings in the bloodthirsty God in the Bible. Are no, they are no different from each other. They both require the same bullshit in return. Something that is of high value that you must offer for a small time temporary benefit and a short life expand on this physical earth. You basically gonna get you basically if you sign this type of contract, you fucked. You got played. But let us continue. But contracts have been made and are still being made without such a condition. Usually the contract is written in duplicate. One copy remains with the sorcerer's remains in the sorcerer's hands, and the other is for the being. It is stated in the books that the being takes both copies. But it, but this is done rarely and only happens with a certain category of beings. Usually the second copy is folded together by the sorcerer and burned. This burning of the contract actually means that the ideas and points of the contract are transmitted to the relevant zone. In this or in a similar manner, with which there may be little differences, which are not essential at all, packs are sealed, especially packs with negative beings. Such a pack can neither be broken by the sorcerer nor by the being and must be adhered to unconditionally. So you, you fucked. That's all it is to it. You didn't did the shit. It's like jumping off a bridge or a cliff. And wanting to go back up. It's too late. So when you didn't fucked up like that. It continues to read. It often happens. That the victim does not even know. That he has made such a horrible contract. And comes to the. Respective sphere. Without knowing that he. Has to pay off the duties. The being has rendered him on earth. Mm, mm, mm. If however bad conscience starts working on the mind of a sorcerer that before the contract expires and if in consequence the sorcerer tries to free himself by any means then the being will try anything to harm the sorcerer and to destroy him again this is why you get the freemasonic fez with the sword on it Many witchcraft trials of the past are the unmistakable proof of this. And sorcerers who felt sorry for their sealing of such contracts and who therefore tried out all means and ways to free themselves have had to atone heavily for their breach of contract at the instigation of of the beings concerned. Many sorcerers. Of ancient times were not able to evade. The funeral pyre. Only because. The idea. And divine spark won. Inside them. And made them prefer death. Instead of remaining in contact. 
with a demon till the expiration of the contract. But sorcerers who strictly adhere to the points of the contract and fulfilled every duty till the period expired always remained under the protection of the dark powers and no power in the world could ever harm them. Those who did not adhere to the contract and regretted their mistake were severely persecuted by the beings. For the latter always found means and ways to harm their former protégés. The kind of contracts described above may be regarded as the usual type. For the sorcerer tries to get into contact with a being by means of the magic of evocation and to maintain his connection with the being either directly or by the spiritualist familiaris serving the being. The reader may now ask whether such a sorcerer is condemned to be the servant of a being or head forever. Answering such a question presents no difficulty to a magician who is equally acquainted with all spheres. As soon as the sorcerer has repaid the head in full measure for its duties on earth, this can take, in our chronology, many hundreds of years. Since time and space are absent in the spheres, the sorcerer's conscience will start working on him more and more, and his four-pole nature feels himself little by little free from the bondage when the sorcerer has paid back every penny of his debt. He can, again, do what he likes. But, if at that point he still stifles his conscience, unwilling to follow it, he will remain in the sphere of his head and will eventually lose his four polarity and identify himself with the plane in which he lives by taking on the vibration of that plane forever. Damn. By this way, he will condemn himself. So y'all check this out. All these rappers that, that claim they may have sold them, sold their souls. These are sorcerers. They're performing sorcery when they on these fucking stages. Doing all these goddamn rituals in your face. Like the Travis Scott guy. Okay. These are sorcerers. But let us continue. The sorcerer or the rappers that's performing on stage. But we just, okay, we just get to the root of how it becomes like the selling soul. Let's just stick with the, what's, what's written by Friends Bardun. The sorcerer then ceases to be a human being. The image of God and becomes a being of that sphere. That is, he sinks down to a demon. So this is all wrapped up in the contract that is being made, uh, that has been made with the demon when somebody fails to carry out what they supposed to done. So he sinks down. This means that he's a very low dimensional demon. Okay, let's continue. This certainly is the most regrettable state a human being can get into and may be called damnation from the religious point of view or as true sin against the Holy Ghost. This would be the complete procedure for the stealing of a contract between a sorcerer and a being of another zone. Should the sorcerer follow the voice of his conscience, he will be able to leave the zone of the head and find a new home in the earth zone. Here he can again live as a four-pole being and renew his spiritual development. If in this case it is necessary for him to return into our physical world, this rebirth will be granted him without any difficulties for in the physical world it is far easier to become purified and to work on one's magical development like other beings 
a reincarnated sorcerer is then able to acquire in our world magic, great magic power. Since he has experience in working with negative powers, such reborn sorcerers are the born magicians. I'll be damned. For they possess inborn magical faculties and do not need to accumulate much knowledge or undergo a special training in magic. I've been said that shit. I've been. If you go watch my video, it's called um, Cultural Transmigration. I've been said that shit. Okay, continuing on. It cannot be denied, however, that it could again happen. That such a person is overcome by the temptation to misuse these powers and that the same head of spirits may approach him anew, possibly under a different mask, to regain his previous victim with the same intentions of taking him again to his fear after his physical death. Such a sorcerer, however, has a much freer will on this earth and can therefore resist such temptations much better. Y'all see how serious this shit is? Y'all see how deep this shit go? It's to the point to where that Damien or demon, low dimensional demon that, that they made a contract with in the past life will even follow them to the next incarnation. And try to take advantage of them again. Because they are already born with innate psychic abilities. Based off their previous life. I don't think y'all understand. See. Somebody that. Could be born into this again. Without understanding that past life. They'll think it's God. They hear a voice of telepathy. And they say God spoke to me. Could be a motherfucking low dimensional deity. Low dimensional demon. Okay? And because they born as a Christian, they don't understand what's really going on. They think it's God. But it's the demon trying to persuade him again like they did in the last life because they had a contract with him. And they want them to be that slave again that demon does. Because they wind up being a slave to that demon once they passed away in their previous life. Whereas while they were physically alive in their previous life, the demon was their slave or servant. See what I'm saying? That's why you got to study all things so you can get a full understanding of what's what and how to break it down and understand it. See, religion don't teach shit like this. So people will say God spoke to me. How the fuck you know it wasn't a low dimensional demon that talked to your ass? And then in reality, it was your God at one point because you was a slave to it. If that had been the situation in which I'm reading. But let's continue. His conscience, too, works much better and will warn him more forcefully than does the conscience of a human being with no such personal career. Thus, it seldom happens that a sorcerer falls in a second time. That's good. Usually, he is so purified by his experience that he walks along the true path of magic and is less inclined to take up contracts with demons or negative spirits. This statement of true facts may be a warning to all truth-seeking people not to follow the path of sorcery. For one can see from what has been said above that such a step is a great regression in the spiritual evolution and development of a human being. That all I have said is no fantastically made up story, but a sad true fact that can be checked by any true magician. The incarnated sorcerer proceeding along the right path of initiation is exposed to a far greater number of temptations than an average human being who is started starting his spiritual development from the beginning. The planes which formerly bound him try time after time 
in the most refined manner to get their previous victim again under their control. Damn, relentless motherfuckers. In this work, I do not intend to name anybody from ancient or modern times who has sealed contracts with beings. Shit, Napoleon, that motherfucker probably won. I'm pretty sure he won. Oh yeah, he, he had to be one. Fuck it, I'm gonna say it. But besides the cases generally known to the public, like Dr. Faltus and Urban Grandier, there are numerous others of whom the public has never heard. There is yet another way to seal contracts, known to only a few initiates. This should be a warning to all those who try to get into contact with various kinds of beings. This pact is not handled directly, but by the help of a human body already existing. Which of the two ways of the seal contracts is the more adventurous depends on the view of the individual magician, the less known way may be preferred by deceased people as well as by other beings of the earth zone, even by beings of higher zones. The getting into contact through a human being requires the human being's control of the elements. The light and the Akasha principle and a higher intelligence and magical maturity on the side of the spirit being which wants to get into contact with and make a contract with the human being. From the hermetic point of view, such a contract is quite possible and is practiced by a number of sorcerers without their differing from the average people by anything strange or unusual. Only the well-trained clairvoyant in the eyes of a genuine magician are able to distinguish such a pact. The sorcerer is usually invited to such a contract by a being and he is not seldom offered such a pact by beings of the elements which live next to the earth. If all conditions are fulfilled by making of such a contract presents no difficulty, the method rests on the following procedure. The being looks for a healthy body, is preferred in this case, which dies a little, which dies of a little cause such as, for instance, during an accident. Also, bodies dying from the coincidences of an inflammation of the lungs of enophilipitis, heart failure, etc., may serve this purpose. On the other hand, bodies are not welcome, which have been destroyed by tuberculosis or other infectious diseases of vital organs and in which the destruction of such organs have been the cause of the person's physical death. So in other words, they don't just want no any old person. They want to make sure your ass inhabitable. Continuing to read on, the restoration of the harmony in a body destroyed by such diseases would take much effort. Hmm. At the moment, the linking thread between body, soul, and spirit rends, and the life matrix is interrupted. The being gets hold of the human body and is able to build up a new thread between itself and the human body by doing what I have already described in Initiation into Hermetics. Y'all go get that book. 
That is by employing the light fluid. It is quite clear that the being, before uniting itself with the physical body, must form its astral body according to the shape and size of the human body concerned, using for this purpose the matter of the elements in order to get into a harmonious unity of the two life threads, the mental and astral matrix. Well, goddamn. So now we're seeing how to take over a person's body, y'all. If you just wanted to practice transmigration or something, voila. The being who has taken possession of a human body in the described way becomes itself a human being in a borrowed body. The relatives and onlookers form the opinion that the dying person after having being in agony has come to life again as if by miracle and finally recovered from the disease. Shit. That's what they think. This is how the relatives and those persons who are not able to observe by clairvoyance and the leaving of the astral body from the physical body look on the event. Since the being possesses a miraculous degree of adaptability and maintains all faculties and powers of the astral world, and since it knows everything, it continues playing the role of the person who actually died. God damn. But it will try to disappear from the surroundings of the relatives, of the relatives, of the deceased person and to get into contact with the sorcerer without attracting attention. So it's going to try to get in contact with the sorcerer again. The being keeps all its abilities of its former sphere in the new body and puts itself at the disposal of the sorcerer. With the exception of a true magician Nobody will ever find out the true facts and nobody will find anything suspicious in two friends or a boyfriend and girlfriend meeting each other. And the people around the two will never find out about the true relations of the two. God damn. The services which the being may render the sorcerer doing his physical existence are exactly the same as if the sorcerer had got into contact with another being of that sphere. If the sorcerer wants to have his influence work on the astral or mental world via this being, then the latter puts itself in a state of trance so undo so can fulfill the sorcerer's wishes so it can fulfill the sorcerer's wishes the question of carnal contact is usually discussed at the moment of the first citation or meeting with the sorcerer and the sorcerer is well informed about the whole procedure that the sorcerer must never say a word to anybody about the matter is only too clear, for otherwise he will have to pay with his life for his communicativeness. Again, that's why they got the sword. The astronomers got the sword right above the crescent moon and star. The crescent moon and star represent they in communion with different dimensions and realms and planets and shit like that because they're doing astral travel and this is what they're doing. They're going to different spheres. But the sword is there to remind them Bitch, you reveal a secret that what we got going on, as far as the demon and that sorcerer, they just that's a reminder. I'm I'm cut your ass down. Now I will hope that y'all have learned something from this video. Okay, this is nothing to play with when it comes to making contracts with low dimensional beings. It's no, it's nothing to play with 
with making contracts, period. That's why I ain't never like signing no fucking contract. I don't give a fuck what it is. No fucking cell phone contract, none of that shit. Okay? I just ain't never been with the shit. Now, I'm not going to continue to read all this because this video would take extremely too long. But point has been made, okay, concerning signing blood contracts and making um, covenants with low-dimensional beings. You're not even supposed to, as far as this book concerns, you're not even supposed to make a contract with high-dimensional beings either. Because this, this, this makes you dependent on them and gives them power over you. When you're supposed to be the God of them and they know this. Anyway, I hope y'all learned something from this video. Peace.